Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this old video, we are first off going to the year 2014, to northeast Pennsylvania and deep into the heart of the Poconos. That autumn, a man was running through the woods as fast as he possibly could. He was dressed in a Bosnian Serb uniform because he was a big fan uh, of the Balkans war, as you do, and he could hear dogs after him in the distance. Growing up, his favorite movie was Rambo First Blood. Now he was living it. He had drawn First Blood, and now he was running like he had been for many weeks by this stage. Before we get into it, please subscribe to see a new crime video every week. It helps out. Now, let's get into the how, the why, and the, you know, what? Let's give it a go. The town of Blooming Grove lies roughly 40 minutes east of world-famous Scranton, Pennsylvania. Bloomingdale, Bloomin Grove is in fact closer to New York than to Philly of Philly. I mean, there's a township there and not really a whole lot else. Google Maps tells me that there is the Blooming Grove Tavern. A few scoops, sounds good. And a sewer plant. Yummy! But you know, have a look and what do you see? Forest, 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 and then there's some more forest over there. Like they could have filmed the Blair Witch Project out there. You could disappear pretty handily. And if you're in those woods, you could go south down to West Virginia or keep going in the other direction to upstate New York. So you get to click pick. In those same woods, not far, but a few forests between it and Blooming Grove, is the PA State Police Barracks. Essentially, it's the State Police Police Station, right? So that is where I'm gonna begin when late one autumn night, it went under siege. On the 12th of September, 2014, just before 11 p.m., so it was getting pretty dark, not cold, but you could start to feel it, there was a shift change. The evening officers were out and the night officers were in. They would do the 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. On the way out, after finishing up his eight hour shift, was Corporal Brian K. Dixon. Brian was 38 years old. He had been with the state police for seven years in 2014. He was married, he was the father of two boys, a former Marine, big baseball fan, and he had a degree in criminal justice. He had in fact just been transferred to Blooming Grove uh, a year before. Before that, he was working where it is always sunny. So it was Corporal Brian Dixon who, that late night at about 10.50 p.m., he was walking out of the barracks, he was walking to his car that was in the car park, surrounded by these dense woods, when a shot rang out, followed by a scream. When people looked around, they saw Brian lying on the ground. Officers, they ran out to him, but more shots were ringing out, so they dove for cover. It was impossible to tell where these shots were coming from, but they were being directed at that state police barracks from somewhere in that extremely dark, dense forest that surrounded them pretty much on all sides. Another officer who happened to be in the car park at that same time, not leaving, but in fact arriving, was Trooper Alex Douglas, and he was a 10-year veteran with the PA State Police. He had been on the phone when the shots rang out, and he ran over to Brian, a Brian in a pool of his own blood. He had tried to drag Brian inside the barracks, but another shot rang out that dark night. Alex went flying onto the ground. He had been shot, and the bullet had went through both his hips. He managed to crawl inside, and other officers who were, who were in there taking cover and were getting their rifles out, they, they dragged Alex to safety and they were just barricaded inside, trying to see anything. They managed to get into an SUV that was in the back of the barracks. They drove it around the front and they put shields over the window so that, you know, bullets couldn't pierce it. And they drove it in front of Brian, who was still lying outside in a pool of his own blood. They shielded him 
and so they managed to bring him inside the barracks also. By the time they did so, though, he was gone. Emergency services, all, all the police arrived from neighboring stations and counties and even states. Trooper Douglas, he was airlifted to safety. As I said, unfortunately, Brian Dixon was, was gone. He'd been shot. He'd been shot twice. And the shooter ran away into those dark autumn woods. It was initially assumed that there were multiple shooters with long rifles camped out in the endless forests surrounding them. A militia or, or something. But they had no idea. In fact, it would be three days before they even had the slightest clue as to who and what had attacked them that night that had put a state police barracks under siege. And it was one person. It was on the 17th of September that the first clue was found. Found by some lad walking the ale dog. He was walking along Route 402, which is the road the barracks is on. He was four miles to the north. As he was walking along, walking the dog and having a goo, he saw off the road, semi-submerged in like a, a drainage pond, like a swamp, was a 2001 Jeep Cherokee. And obviously hearing about what had just happened down the road, he called it in. The police were quickly able to trace the license plate of that 2001 Jeep Cherokee to an older couple. An older couple named Deborah and Jean. And they lived uh, in another small township in those same woods. It was a town called Canadensis. It was half hour south. That couple, they had a son. And the police knew they were looking for a man named Eric Freen pretty quickly because in that Jeep Cherokee they found Eric Freen's social security card and his driver's license. Along with bullet casings that matched the shots fired three days previous at the police barracks. I, I, don't, I don't know if he was just mad to, yeah, here I am, it was me. He may as well have just shouted while he was shooting. So now there was a major, and I mean over 1,000 officers, state police from PA, New York, New Jersey, FBI, US Marshals, ATF, the whole, the whole gang, the whole gang got together for a big old like Avengers style team up. They were now in those woods looking for an Eric who was on the run. Eric Freen was 31 years old, born in New Jersey, but he grew up in Pennsylvania. And in fact, he went to Pocono Mountain High School, not terribly far away, so he was very familiar with the area. He was an Eagle Scout, he got all those little badges, good for him. And he knew how to live off the land. In 2014, he was living with his parents in Canadensis, about a half hour's drive from the barracks. His dad, Eugene, was a retired army major, so he was around guns and all that sort of stuff from youth and he was especially around and drawn to the heroic tales his dad Eugene would tell of his army days. In fact, Eric loved the military. He loved guns. He loved, and I mean really loved, reenactments. Especially like World War II reenactments. He ended up working on a couple of documentaries as a background actor or technical advisor. Did you get it? My name is Eric Green. We're here today at Fort Mifflin, uh, Vietnam Remembrance Day. How did you feel, um, uh, having been to a few of these, that the reenactment went today? Can you give us a commentary on that? The reenactment we saw today was... Uh, it's hard to call it like really a reenactment. A bunch of guys went out and popped off some blanks, blank ammunition from the rifles. Uh, you know, it's really, it's, it's, it's Remembrance Day, it's to, to commemorate the veterans, it's not really to, to play army, to you know, basically enact a fantasy. He loved, like, old war shite. In fact, that actually caused him to get in trouble. The only time he was ever in trouble with the law before was in 2004, when he was 21 years old. Uh, he was arrested and accused of stealing basically World War II stuff from like a, a reenactment, um, I don't know what you call them, scenario? 
battle. He was jailed for 109 days and he had to pay back $3,000. But other than, than that, he had no criminal history or anything like that. Nothing really that would make authorities aware of him. You know, until now. He also did Balkan's War reenactments. Uh, that's a bit of an odd choice of a war to get, uh, you know, dolled up for. He just took one look at those brutal war atrocities and he said, Wow, I've never seen anything more beautiful. Now, apparently it wasn't the war itself. He was, you know, uh, stunning. Uh, he just liked the uniforms. Just liked the look. So much so, he founded Istokni Vuk, which I'm sure I butchered, meaning Eastern Wolf. And Eastern Wolf is probably exactly what he saw himself as, and he would get all dolled up. They would, he would go, you know, all the time to have these airsoft, you know, battles or, you know, setups and reenactments and all that sort of stuff. He, he made a couple of trips to, uh, to, to that part of Eastern Europe, just having a goo around, you know? Um, I wonder if he wore the uniform. And so he lived with his folks in the middle of nowhere. He attended college a couple of times, but never finished any of the degrees. In the meantime, he worked at the local supermarket, stocking shelves, uh, kind of typically described as a loner. And he fired four shots in total at the Blooming Grove State Police Barracks. Two hit uh, Corporal Brian Dixon, one hit Trooper Alex uh, Douglas, and then he ran like crazy through those, those pitch black woods, his, his adrenaline, you know, his heart bumping. He ran through those woods uh, to his car, which was about two miles away. He got in and he started driving. Now he started driving with the lights of that Jeep Cherokee off to avoid detection. As you can imagine, driving through a, uh, a road in the middle of nowhere with the lights off, he couldn't see where he was going, so hence, he went off the road and into that swamp where the car would be found just a couple of days later. So he was now in that big forest on foot, fleeing with thousands of people looking for him. He even made it to the big leagues. He was put on the FBI's 10 most wanted. Look at you. People would say he was a crack shot, an expert, sharpshooter and survivalist. And so he was now survivalisting in those woods, you know, with, with, like I said, pretty much decombined, combined police forces of like a lot, right? And so there was numerous times when they, the police and authorities would see him in the distance on the sides of mountains and hills, across fields and meadows, fleeing away from them. And every time he would evade them, they'd see him on a hill in the distance by the time they got there, he was gone. This got to the point where the police believed he was taunting them, like they'd put on their binoculars and then they'd just see him in the distance. He was seen by civilians too, but when they'd alert the police, he was gone. The hunt focused primarily on the Delaware State Forest, and they would find from time to time things he had left behind. For example, one thing Eric really was just mad about was Serbian cigarettes. What's like a weeboo but for Serbia? Also soiled diapers, um, I guess he really did not want to stop moving. Though I'm not sure if Rambo shit himself. Caves, abandoned, seasonal homes, shacks, all were searched. Whirlybirds, dogs, you name it, his face was plastered everywhere. Be advised, lethal force is authorized for protection of self and others if positive ID is made and subject refuses to surrender. I will repeat. Per PSP command, lethal force is authorized for protection of self and others if positive ID is made and subject refuses to surrender. And his family, um, they cooperated. They had obviously no idea where he was. He had in fact, uh, Eric had told his parents in fact, that he was moving to Delaware for a job. And that's, that was his explanation for just packing up his stuff and leaving. But they did say that before he left, he shaved his head into like a weird mohawk. And upon searching their home, they found two rifles were missing, an AK-47 and a 308 rifle. A 308 rifle can do a lot of damage to a human body. It already did. And Eugene Frayn said that his son Eric was a... He was a... He was a good shot. Once they thought they were close when he used his cell phone to call his parents on the 18th of September. 
and it was traced to Price Township. When they got there, they found the phone, clothing, and his diary, where he wrote. September 12th, got a shot around 11 p.m. and took it. He dropped. I was surprised at how quick. I took a follow-up shot on his head, neck area. He was still and quiet after. September 13th, had to run, Jeep stuck, ditched the rifle. Went on foot, heading southwest to stream under Interstate 84. September 14th, slept all day in abandoned camper. No police activity, started campfire. They would later find, in fact, more of his diaries kind of strewn about the place. It's like that Slenderman game. Uh, and this is like some of, the more, some of the other stuff he wrote during this entire manhunt, which he was, it was documented. He was a great little writer. September 18th, started campfire. Slept well for the first time in three days. Went deeper into the woods. Set up shelter and cleaned up. Cell phoned home twice to let them know I'm still alive. Got text saying I'm a suspect. Saw patrol, not spotted. They stuck to the trails. Listened to portable radio. News media calling me a survivalist. Ha! <laughs> Catchy phrase, I guess. Shelter in place ordered in nearby residential areas by spooked cops. October 5th. Helos close. Safe to travel after dark. Hunting closed. Two cops fell from tree stand and flown to hospital. That's what those helos must have been. No respite. Recon went well. This massive search can't last forever. Slept in morning, plugged in laptop. Bathed and tried fasting. Did laundry, got piece of chocolate. And the search continued for week after week after week. $100,000 was offered for his capture. Pipe bombs were also found in the woods. Also a discarded, the discarded AK-47 and some ammo. Searching his parents' home for any information, on his computer, he'd been reading up how to avoid police manhunts, sniper training, supplies needed to make it in the wild. So the AK-47, that was one of the guns he had, that was found, but there was still a sniper in those woods. A sniper who knew the woods well, knew how to hunt and how to survive and live off the land. Um, a sniper who was not afraid to take lives, in fact had already taken one and tried to take another and had left behind traps, pipe bombs. So, I mean, there was a great fear that he might start picking off, you know, uh, the searchers one by one by one and then disappearing into the woods, just doing like this guerrilla tactics on the, the hunters, essentially. Don't push it. And he was always one step ahead. This would go on for 48 days, hunting Eric Freen. It was on the 30th of October 2014 that officers were searching fields near an abandoned hangar at Birchwood Pocono Air Park. As you can see, it's surrounded by dense woods, and walking across a field, officers spotted Eric just walking. He was unarmed. He surrendered without a fuss, arrested with Corporal Brian Dixon's own handcuffs. The slain trooper's handcuffs placed on the wrist of his suspected killer. To confirm, the subject will be held. Uh, Blooming Grove car two is in route with Corporal Dixon's handcuffs. He'll be there in approximately 20 minutes, so we'll stand by until that takes place. Then, the 48-day search ends with his final radio transmission from Trooper Dixon's state police car, used to transport the captured suspect to face the criminal justice system. PSP says, sorry, mileage 11652, He didn't resist, but, um, well, the officers got some digs in. He had been staying in that hangar for, for a while. His supplies were there, his guns, but he was running out of food. Trooper Douglas, um, he had a tough time making a recovery. Um, remember, he'd been shot. The bullet went through both his hips. Uh, it was a trio eight round. In fact, one of his legs would have to be amputated. But he survived. Um, and Brian Dixon would have a, you know, a, a, a huge funeral. So why did he do this? What was his motive, you know, to begin this attack? in the first place. Well, he said he wanted to wake people up, start a revolution. He said he never had any intention of, um, you know, attacking or hurting any of the police who were after him. In fact, he said that he was 
almost about to turn himself in when he was arrested. Here's a letter he wrote to his parents where he kind of explains a little bit about why he did this whole thing. I have seen so many depressing changes made in my time that I cannot imagine what it must be like for you. There is so much wrong, and on so many levels, only passing through the crucible of another revolution can get us back to the liberties we once had. I do not pretend to know what the revolution will look like, or even if it would be successful. It seems Eric Stad Eugene was a huge influence on uh, Eric's life, and he would tell all these kind of exaggerated stories of his own time in the military, and that kind of rubbed off on Eric, and it kind of set a bar that was, you know, Eric could never reach, essentially, because the stories were really exaggerated. His father also spoke of uh, his hatred for the police, how he thought the police were too powerful, and that kind of led to Eric hating the cops too. So in the end, it's like daddy issues. It kind of always is. Little boys have no father. And young lookers shouting at Freen as he was led out of the courthouse after today's hearing. NBC10 reporter Randy Gyllenhaal was there to send us this reaction. And then this video showing Eric Freen being walked out of the state police barracks in Blooming Grove as he was being taken to jail this morning. Eric Freen went on trial for first-degree murder, terrorism, and almost a dozen other charges in April 2017, two and a half years after he was captured. The trial lasted 11 days, after which he was found guilty on all counts. He was sentenced to death. He was scheduled to be executed in June 2020, but the governor of Pennsylvania put a moratorium uh, on, you know, executions. Uh, so no lethal injection for Eric just yet, uh, but he still sits on death row, like, today. It's a crazy story of a real-life Rambo on the run for two, for almost two months, causing all sorts of havoc, shutting down an entire section of the state, it's it's incre incredible story, it's crazy. Trying to take lives and he took one, it's scary shit. A guy who had so many airsoft battles and was so obsessed with reenactments, he probably saw this as just another one and he was the hero on the run. Basically an act of fantasy. Only this time the bullets were very, very real. He smoked his Serbian cigarettes, he played with his toy guns, and he worked in the grocery store. And then he was out in the woods, having taken a life. With the very real fear, he may take many, many more. Lethal force was even authorized to be used on him. He was plotting, planning, plotting the whole time for some kind of revolution to start. It didn't really seem like he he thought it true terribly well. Honestly though, if waking people up was his whole game, it didn't really seem like he believed in it himself. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here with Misha. Um, if you want to learn more about this story, as with all my stories, references and sources are down below in the description where you will also find uh, the Patreon, the That Chapter of Patreon, and merch and all the other stuff. Thanks again for watching. Uh, I really appreciate it. As always, please look after yourselves. Hey, and each other. Because I love you. Mike out.